Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. Today, we're going to interview an author uh, and a uh, multifamily syndicator that lives just up the road from me here uh, in, uh, in the Hillsborough Pinellas County area, which is Tampa, St. Pete. His name is Brian Chavis. And Brian is the co-founder of Chavez Realty Group. And he wrote a book uh, called Buy It, Rent It, Profit. And it's got the unique distinction of being in the U.S. Library of Congress, which is, which is kind of cool, very unusual. Brian, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's do what we usually do, which is kind of have you talk about um, – uh, I'm sure you can do a much better job of introducing yourself than I did, but but more importantly, talk about how you got into this business and why you love real estate and, you know, how you started and maybe how you got to where you are now. Yeah, um, you know, I got into this business, uh, really, uh, my first job was playing basketball, so um, you know, I got into this business after, you know, uh, that career ended, I got uh, leasing Leasing apartments was probably one of the easiest jobs I can get, considering that my vehicle wasn't working. Uh, I had a Volkswagen Jetta. I used to have to jump start it to get it get it going. So it was not the most reliable of vehicles. So someone I don't know how I came across um, leasing apartments, but you know, in the ads, I believe back in the old days, you know, they used to have the ads and in, in, the, in the newspaper, and the ad said, "Hey, you know, live where you work." So obviously we're having a beat down car living where you work made sense. So that's kind of how I got into the real estate business and uh, worked my way up from leasing into management into the acquisition specialist and just really kind of fell in love with the, with the process and um, really out of greed and motivation to one day, you know, have the kind of money and, and, and lifestyle that the owners that I worked for, because uh, I was fortunate to work for private owners in the beginning. And then I was fortunate to work for, more of an institutional minded investor, uh, like your, your Camden's and your post properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, as I stayed in the industry, so I got to see the best of both worlds, but ideally I got to see, you know, really and understand the real estate and how wealth was really being generated through these multifamily properties and, um, and how important the role of property management played. So, um, that's really how, how it all got started. Um, you know, so, was it all? Uh, was it uh, same same area that you're in now? Uh, yeah, it was in the. Yeah, yes, it was in the uh, the Bay Area. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And and so you started as leasing. You moved into management, and then you said uh, that you were in char- You were involved in acquisitions. Tell tell talk about the role that you played in in the acquisition de- uh, you know department for either the private or the more institutional investors. What sorts of things did uh, were you doing? More like asset management. So strategic oh, okay. setting. Strategically, then you know, got out of the actual day to day property management, but was you know, strategically setting market mass and in, in mm-hmm. pairing uh, future values and being able to anticipate future values. Um, but of course, based on what you understand as an operator, Monday through Friday, you take that same knowledge as an asset manager. But an asset manager, unlike a property manager, is really focused on the overall growth of the asset. We're looking at values based on cash flows, and um, you know, so it's a it's, you know, it's a different process. You're setting budgets. Um, you're also making sure that everyone's hitting their, their goals as far as the construction. Because back then, it was more about, that, you know, what we call value-add plays. Mm-hmm. You're buying in lower-income neighborhoods and increasing the values, and you're maybe taking a C, C-plus asset and t- trying to turn it into a BB-plus asset. So, right. so, you know, the asset management at that time was a lot of – you're juggling a lot of balls. So you're one day, you're a property manager – Next day you're a financial analyst. You know, the next day you're you're a construction foreman. So I mean, you're really kind of really doing it all back then. Wow. Yeah, that that is quite a bit. Um, uh, what what an incredible experience, though. You know, yeah, to, it was. I didn't think about it at the time. Right. I yeah, it was probably was, a little overwhelming at the time. But yeah. That, well, actually, I thought I was getting robbed. You know, I'm like, uh, uh, you know, I need to be paid more. But right. um, little did I know I was going to school and getting this education that one right. put me in this position that I'm in. So. No, that's that's great. Uh, you know, uh, we're we're man, You know, we we uh, you know that whole old whole man asset management component. Uh, you know, people think they can just hire a third party property manager and and you know they're 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 said and done. And and <laughs> no, absolutely yeah. not the case. You've got to manage the managers. And and it's certainly if you're doing a reposition of any sort, uh, which you know most people try to do something to add some value. And uh, you know, and 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 uh, 
you know, you have to manage that process. You have to manage that renovation process and make sure that, you know, that things are sequenced properly. For example, you know, if, if you're like, like we're doing kitchens in one of our properties right now. And, you know, you, you, you have to make sure that the, the cabinets get painted before the countertop goes on. And, and, and then the, you know, the floor goes in last and all these things that, that you don't think about uh, and manage that process. And, and so you were doing all that back then correct, huh? correct. wow okay uh and and of course an asset manager like you said has to has to pay attention to the market rents and 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 study the competition and make sure that you know that uh that you're that you've got um uh, a competitive product and that you're not you're not overpriced or underpriced so it's it's a continual right. process of evaluating the marketplace um and uh uh, and then, of course, you're man, and then, of course, you're reviewing, like you say, budgets. And I just want to drill down a little bit on asset management because we really haven't talked about it much on the show. So I'm giving it a little more energy than I than I might normally. But uh, this topic's important. And you know, when when you guys buy a property, you're going to manage the asset, even if you've got a third party property manager, like we're describing here. And so you're, you're going to get. Uh, a, you know, reports from that management company that need to be studied. You're going to get, of course, P&Ls and mm -hmm. budgets and rent roll and uh, vacancy reports and uh, lease expiration reports and all these things that need to be reviewed um, and, and studied for anomalies and issues uh, before they become big issues. Um, what, what else? Am I forgetting anything for asset management, Brian? Uh, I mean, you, you're, managing, you're managing the manager, you're, you're studying the, the financials, you're keep, staying on top of the market, and you're managing any, any renovations, repositions. I think that's probably about, that's probably about it. Yeah, that's a yeah. lot, but it's a lot. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, that, 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 that sounds like a, that's a mouthful. I mean, right. and also making sure that you're, you know, I think above all, one of the main factors is understanding the demographic. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is understanding who your prospect tenant is. You never want to lose sight um, because you can, you know, you can begin to get a little um, crazy when it comes to over rehabbing or over, you know, when as far as amenities are concerned and what types of amenities you're adding in, you know, people can get carried away. So especially when you have a group of owners and there's, you know, you have a, a few managing members where individuals have a lot of say, so someone has to be involved and really know, um, you know, with both the asset management and the property management, really understanding who that prospect demographic is, RIE that prospect tenant is, because you can also over improve. Sure. Uh, you don't. You want to make sure that you're not over improving. Uh, and you know, we can't. I, I cannot put a. I wouldn't rehab a kitchen if I didn't think that I can raise the rents to be able to pay for the the cost of those those kitchens and those those new kitchens and those new new appliances. So, at the end of the day, you know. If I'm rehabbing a unit, and let's just say that rehab costs me two thousand dollars, I got to be able to figure out what the payback period is on that, and having a realistic idea of who your targeted demographic is or who your targeted prospect tenant is is going to help you in understanding how quickly uh, and how efficiently I'm going to receive that payback. So yeah, no, that's that's I'm really glad you said that. It's funny. I just had a call with uh, my partners on this on a deal we're doing up in Dayton today this morning, and that was one that was the conversation. You know, how far do we go with this kitchen remodel? Where you know the, we're, it's an a it's an a asset. We're going to put in granite countertops, but you know we're debating painting the cabinetry. Uh, it's it's oak now. We're debating painting it white, so it's it's not as dated looking. And and you know and and it, and it is important. It's critical to know what that demographic wants in that marketplace. Do you know? Do they want stain and a stainless appliance package, or do they prefer black? You know, uh, you know, do they like plank flooring or do they like carpet in the living room? You know, uh, because uh, again, and you can go too far. And, and so these units happen at fireplaces and we're debating what to do with that wall. It's just those kinds of things um, as it relates to the demographic are critical because like you said, it's so easy to overspend and, and then not have a return on that investment. That's, that's a very common mistake that, that, that owners make uh, and is managing that process. Well, this exactly. is good. This is good because we have not talked about this before on the show. So it's definitely adding value. So talk about, um, you know, I know that uh, you just did a syndication in St. Pete, which is an area I absolutely love. Downtown St. Petersburg, guys, if you ever come visit, it's got an energy. It's got restaurants and shops, and it's right on the bay. It's just a fantastic environment now. In fact, we, my Tiffany and I, almost moved there before we bought our compound here in Sarasota. But um, it's uh, it's a it's a really happening town right now. And so you know the the 
you know, obviously that, dic- that, that correlates to more expensive properties, but you found a 22 unit. I, you closed that last year. Can you talk about that property? Yeah, at the end of last year, Park Plaza, 22 units. You know, I like to think of it as a workforce project. Okay. Uh, being able to uh, 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 add a workforce type product in that downtown St. Pete, as you know, everything that's coming out of the ground right now is Class A. Right. Um, there's not a lot of real Class B product in the area. Um, so, you know, for me, I think it was a value add play. A lot of people, you know, really didn't understand what, what I meant. You know, they didn't think that we can get a value add play in downtown St. Pete. However, if you looked at the rent schedules, when I got it in October, we were at about the average, about 820. You know, I'm already pushing eight, I'm sorry, 950, 975 right now. Hmm. So there was still value add there. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, but the thing is, you know, most people are scared to get into those markets, right? Is, you know, that people are scared of those lower caps. Right. However, for me, I always felt that if I could get my investors a, a you know a steady return and an efficient return, when you're looking considering the IRR, you're more so talking about the efficiency from which these investors are getting their return. So you can't well, always. What, what do you mean by efficiency? What what, what just so I'm I'm clear on what that means to you? Well, and it, so let's just so if you get have two returns, let's just say we put in a hundred thousand dollars and you get two properties and both properties return two x. Right. On your initial investment, you would think both properties are comparable. Well, you say, oh, yeah, those are comparable properties. But if I told you, well, property A gets your money back in one year and property B gets your money back to you in 20 years, they're no longer comparable. One okay. So, so your efficiency means the speed of the, of the return. Got it. Right. Okay. So that is what the IRR, internal rate of return, is going to calculate the efficiency from which one gets their investment back. So, you know, when you look at the efficiency, when you're looking at a bigger picture, you, you know, you have to look at a bigger picture than just the cap rates or the cap being a little lower. I, I don't mind a lower cap rate because I know there's value there. Obviously, the higher the cap rate, the more risk the investment. So that's why you'll find people will say, well, I find I found a 50 unit with 11 cap. Well, of course you did. It's located in the middle of the hood. Right. Well, you should get a 13 because you're going to have a lot more risk because what you see on paper there is not going to be what the property manager is going to receive. They're going to have a lot more turnovers. They're going to be chasing rent. You know, units are going to come back to you. Trashed. Trashed. (laughs) So at the end of the day, yeah, you should be getting a 13 because there's a lot more risk. I'm in downtown St. Pete for all the various reasons you just explained. So, of course, I I factor in that I'm going to get a much lower – uh, cap rate. Cap rate. Sure. And I don't mind that because right. again, the efficiency from which I get my money is going to be a lot better um, than a much more. Did you have? Did you have to? Did you have to do some renovations there? Did you do any work? Talk about that. Uh, yeah, I did. I did some minor stuff, more so lipstick on the pig, um, okay. just increasing curb appeal because I wanted to give that the units were pretty much already rehabbed. So now I'm going in and doing some touch up. Okay. Some of the rehabs and maybe changing some of the fixtures and things like that, but nothing major. Okay. Uh, so okay. Most of it came on the curb appeal, adding value and adding amenities uh, for these tenants to kind of keep up with the amenity counts. Right. I'm seeing on the Class A properties, of course, I can't put pools in and, and things of that nature. However, I can put the 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 uh, the, the barbecue pits, mm-hmm. upgrade all the patio furniture, maybe put in decking all new landscaping, things of that nature. So those are a lot of the things that I'm, that I'm adding uh, to our property, kind of trying to give it some class A amenities. Um, nice. You know, so yeah, right, nice. Wi-Fi and things like that in common areas and our garden area. So, you know, those are the nice. things, you know, that I'm focusing on. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. When you were, when you were going, and I think when you were starting out and, and you were, uh, you know, you were progressing, um, in this business, in this property management business, are there any aha moments or experiences that come to mind? Aha moments. I just, just like, you know, I mean, I think you kind of alluded to one where you're, where, you know, you're, you're making all this money for other people. Why not make it for yourself? <laughs> I probably have an aha moment every week, bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, the real aha moment, I guess one that, you know, that your viewers probably would appreciate for me is um, really the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Um, the difference between people flipping houses, because I see now on TV, everything is about flipping houses. And I think people have the wrong idea of thinking what I do as an investor 
is flipping houses. And I don't really think, see, and I don't mean to, this is not to be critical of that industry, but I don't consider flipping houses investing. It's, uh, it's a know, job. It's, it's, it's a, not only a, a job. I think everybody, it's a, anything you clock in is a job, but it's just not, it's not real estate investing. I think people get the wrong idea because, you know, they're not coming to the table understanding the IR or understanding terminal uh, uh, yields, understanding some of the things that I'm, you know, they're like looking at me like, you know, what are, what are you talking about IRRs? We're talking about terminal rates and, and, and cap rates and things of that nature. So to really understand, and I, you know, I only have a high school degree. I yeah. barely got that. Me, me too, brother. Me you know, too. I mean, same, so, same thing. You know, I, to, you know, to be able to articulate and be able to become a master of your craft, is, I think it's very important. So, and the reason why I mention that is because if I can do it, then anyone can do it. So there's no excuse for you not to learn these things. However, don't mix flipping properties and what you see on TV up, for what I'm doing in the in the syndication and buying multifamily because they're two different things. They're completely one different. Playing, one is playing checkers and the other is playing chess. Which okay, is I board. like that. I it's like that. Same, same board, but two totally different games. And I think the flipping is checkers and the and the multifamily, what we're doing, that that's chess. I love it. No, I love that. That's a great analogy. I'm going to steal that one. I love that. Yeah. And, and that's and, the aha moment. <laughs> that's the aha. Okay. All right. No, that's great. No, that's a good, that's a great answer actually. And you know, so many people out there flipping houses and, and making good money and it's a great way to make money. I made money. Too. Great. I mean, and, and even wholesaling, but it's a job and you know, you get enough multifamily property under your belt and you can spend half the year in Europe, okay, and, and, and have the freedom to do whatever it is you want to do. And every, all you have to do is make it to the first of the month and, and your checks come. And, and so, you know, you're not out there beating the bushes trying to find deals your whole life. Um, but, uh, you know, you're building an annuity. And what, what can you buy that somebody else pays off, right? I mean, nothing. I mean, th this, that's why this business is so exciting. So, um, you know, so what do you think is the most challenging part of your role right now? What, 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 what's, what's the challenge? Finding the deal. Finding the deal. Yeah. Finding the deals. I'm sure you can. Uh, oh yeah. No me. question. You know, um, but again, you know, just keeping in mind who your viewers are, you know, their challenges might be slightly different than my challenges. Oh, I don't think so. Everybody's struggling with that. Everybody's right. struggling with finding deals. Yeah. Um, but if I had to think for a moment, like, you know, what your viewers may be stressing about. Um, you keep calling them viewers. More people sorry, are probably going to listen. Than listeners. I'm, I'm looking at myself on the screen. Yeah, so yeah, I know. I know. It's a little dis yeah, the, uh, listeners, no. viewers, if it's on YouTube. But what the listeners are probably maybe struggling with, uh, you know, perhaps could be the systems that are used to operate these, these properties. Because if you're going to be in Europe, one is, one is obviously uh, – is under the uh, impression that you have the property running itself. And there's a lot of people who invest in multifamily that are really not that sophisticated, you know, um, and they really are not efficient in what they're doing. Just because they, just because you're an owner doesn't necessarily mean you know what you're doing. Oh, no question. So you got to kind of understand that the systems that you have in place, and typically, the, and when I talk about systems, I mean two types of systems. You have hard systems and soft systems. The hard systems are the procedures manuals that are in place and those procedures manuals are going to identify the work that needs to be done by the property manager and then tell the property manager how to go about performing that work consistently mm -hmm. and only through consistently or consistency can I really achieve profitability. Mm -hmm. Then you have the soft systems which are the technology that you use to run the property and you have the building, the app folio and one that I really like right now that I'm really big on is this new homey uh, maintenance um, uh, application that is really um, organizing the maintenance side, which is the biggest struggle for most operators. What's that? What's that domain? Homey, H O M E E, Homey Property Maintenance. Mm. It really has. It's like the Uber of property maintenance. It's really um, changing the game and helping. Talk, talk about the features. The features are so. If I my tenants can go into this platform, they can log right on into this platform and put a work order and take a picture. It can come to either me or my maintenance guy and it'll flag and it'll say, hey, tenant wants this done. I can say yes or no. If I say yes, then automatically the system will find a vendor in the area that's close by and grab that vendor and put that vendor onto that maintenance work order and it all kind of just systemize and then the vendor and the tenant can talk to each other where I'm not having to sit there 
and put a lot of time into organizing and, and playing armchair quarterback. And this, this software does it all for me, including the billing and the uh, reporting of, of the work order and the, and the amount of maintenance tickets that I have. Is this your, is this your software or is this? No, a, I wish okay, it was, okay. no. Okay, you, you sounded pretty passionate about it. I thought, uh oh, is this is this a pl- is this a plug? <laughs> oh no, it's, it, I, I'm passionate about it because I mean, again, I'm an operator. So right, right. No, I love it. No, that's, that's, that's I'm trying to get to Europe, like you're saying. If I can, I can't get to right. Europe if I'm worried if I'm bogged down in maintenance work order. So if Agreed. I'm passionate, it's because I love at it. At the end of the day, it's you know that's if if it makes my job easier, then yeah, absolutely, I'm gonna be passionate about it. Love it, love it. Now let me ask you this: Is this like one of those? Uh, and, and I'm not familiar with it. Shame on me. Is this one of those softwares where you know you can, like a guy to use an iPad and sign yeah. off on it and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, that's your phone. You can use your phone. You, right. Your platform is really built for the smartphone, so you can run everything right from your smartphone. Oh, I love it, love it, love it. Okay. So let me ask you this, you know, knowing what you know now, you've been around quite a while uh, in this business quite a while and, and seen a lot of, you know, seen a lot of stuff. I mean, when, in fact, when did you start? When, when did you actually get started? Oh, wow. Uh, probably the early 2000s. Okay. All right. So before the crash. So you went through the crash. Okay. Oh, I went through the crash with some property, with some assets. So, yeah, oh, did you? Did you? Did you, have yeah. a, did you have a seminar like I did? Uh, no, but I, I probably should have one, yeah. you know, so, uh, yeah, right. I, I went through the crash with some, yeah. I had eight, I had 800 houses and multiple apartment complexes and I had 160 in Hillsborough Pinellas, another hundred up in Pasco. These are counties for those of you listening here in Florida and then a dun- bunch down by me and, and I, I exploded. <laughs> it was ugly. Wow. There's still blood on the walls. Yeah. Anyway, but so, so knowing what you know, uh, Brian, what would you tell your 20 year old self? I mean, what would you, what might you do differently? Keep knowing what you know now about this business. What I, what would I, if I, if I oh, wow. Well, I don't know if you know, um, I had a brain tumor. Wow. In, in 2012. Wow. No, and, I did not. Uh, and so, you know, I, you know, just to say, what I would tell my, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, this brain tumor was unlike any, you know, a lot because it was on my motor cortex. So I lost my speech. I lost my ability to walk, talk. Wow. Um, you know, so I had to deal with it for two years before they actually pulled it out of my head. So, um, I mean, there's a lot that I would tell a 20, you know, my 20 year old. Yeah. Self. Well, probably, probably more of a spiritual nature oh, in, man. in light of that. Right. Yeah. You said a mouthful there. So absolutely. Wow. I think, you know, for the most part, yeah, a lot of it's spiritual and, and, you know, um, you know, I don't know, right. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you, you know, going through what you went through in two, 2000, but during the five to eight, during the, the downturn, I'm sorry, 2008. I mean, these are, these are, you know, these are life altering experiences that really, you know, for me, I, it just, if I can tell anybody, your listeners is, you know, whoever's going through something right now, whether it be a sickness, whether it be a downturn or a market or losing properties, or, you know, you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay the light bills. Um, just understand that most of these moments are really extremely defining moments on how to build one's character. And that, um, you know, that, yeah, and I, and I know it's tough to say, appreciate the moment right now and appreciate the ability to develop that character. Cause again, when you're trying to pay the light bills, feed your family, it's, it's tough. But, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and again, that, you know, when you do come out, there's a season for everything. Nothing lasts forever. And when you do come into the next season, you're just so much more in tune to yourself. You're so much, you, you built and developed so, so much character. Um, and it's just, it will help you. It's, 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 just, it's, 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 it's a process to level up. And I would just, you know, tell my 20-year-old self, you know, don't despise the humble beginnings and, 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 and you know, and, 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 and stay consistent during the, during these storms that you're going to have, because they're going to come and you just must stay consistent. You know, you really have to, you know, to understand, you know, that there's a season for everything and these storms don't last forever. So just you know, keep your spirituality about yourself. And for me, that's been the most, the biggest thing that I've done is, is, is make sure that I focus on keeping the spirituality versus it was all about making money back when the, before the downturn, you know, it was all about how many doors can we get? How quick can I get to Europe? You know, it's all about the money. But it was, it was, it was, there has to be a balance because if there's no, there's no, I mean, any, 
you know, it, it, too much of any one thing is really not all that good for you. And I, uh, I am so impressed, my friend. I got to tell you, I'm so impressed. I did not expect that to come out of your mouth. I expect you to say, oh, I'd have bought more properties faster. You know, that's usually the answer I get when I ask that question. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm blown away. And, and you're so right, because these experiences, they define us. They, they, yes. they help us grow. They, they make us stronger. Uh, they, they, they help us deal with fear in a much better way. Okay. And, and, Absolutely. you know, uh, they, and, and, and you're right. Uh, if, if you can remain consistent and not get paralyzed by fear and, and, and push forward in spite of it and realize that this too shall pass when you're in the thick of it, uh, which is easy for me to say, I got to tell you, I mean, I was hiding under a rock. I lost 50 million bucks, real money. And, and I mean, it was, it was, it was painful, real painful, but yeah. I mean, I'm back now. I'm, you know, life is beautiful. You're, you're as for you as well. I mean, you know, you come out the other side, a better person. And yes. so when you're in the thick of it, it's hard to see the forest for the trees. But when you look back on it, you know, they talk about a silver lining. There is always a silver lining. I don't oh. care what it is. Would you agree? Absolutely. 100. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Love. I wouldn't trade it for a moment, including the brain tumor. So no, um, no, wow, that's 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 yeah. wow, that's that's really really profound. Um, so let me ask you this: What inspires you? Who inspires you? What, what pushes you? What, what what you know is is there is there a person or a thing or a, you know that 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 that. Well, <laughs> You know, of course, the your family. You know, right, the, of course, the, 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 those check marks. Right. You know, your family, your loved ones that are close, your partners, your friends. Um, but really, when it comes to people, I really try not to get too inspired by people because people, you know, they're human. They let you down. So I try to really focus my inspiration on, on my spirituality. Something mm -hmm. I feel that doesn't won't let me down. So I've que I question it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I mean, I question the brain tumor. I question things that I've gone through from a spiritual standpoint, why would you put me through certain things? However, as you said, there's a season for everything. And, and for me, my spirituality and, and, and my God has been consistent through all that. So that's kind of where I place my focus on my inspiration. Um, all right. just really try to always sow seeds and give back to others. When you were saying, hey, in the beginning of our podcast, what can I do for you? I really had to think about it because I really wasn't here to gain something, I'm, 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 for me, it's all about sowing seeds and giving. I think that's one of the biggest. I love it. I different. love it. You know, it's like I gotta stop and think a minute what I can do to benefit myself because now I rewired myself and my thinking to be more. How do I? How do I sow? I, love seeds? It. I know we're limited. Our time here is very limited. So for me, coming through what I've come through, it's more so how many seeds can I plant, and then by default, I get. Oh, you return it comes back tenfold comes back. exactly it's so easy you know whenever someone is depressed or really struggling emotionally they are always focused inwardly okay and when they take and they take their energy and give give love give happiness give education empower lift other people up it pulls them out of their own stuff and you know and it's so easy like is to get caught up in fear and 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 that and and yeah i i, I that's I, i'm really glad that you uh referenced my asking you how i could help you on this podcast because because you did struggle with it and i was kind of surprised by it actually and now now that you defined why you know again i i keep getting more impressed with you brother i gotta tell you i, I really am and and I cause, no because most people you know and and i was there too you know i i lived in this eight million dollar mansion on on the beach here and i had the cars and the beautiful family and and I was so focused on me, 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 that, you know, uh, and I had a big head because my net worth went up $17 million in 2006 while I slept. And, you know, you know, when you get a big head, you think, you, you know, I thought I was a real estate god. God or the, the universe smacks you down. And, that's, and that was 2008. And, and so I had that same memo. I mean, I didn't have the brain tumor, you know, like you did, but, but the same result, you know, because, yeah, exactly. you know, you know it, it, was, it was like a humbling and it was like a realization that there's more to life than Rod or, or, or Brian, right? I mean, it's, right. it's yeah, I love it, love it. 
So let me ask you this, back to real estate. I mean, I, I, could, I could talk about the other topic forever because I'm passionate about it, uh, but, but um, giving back, for example, is just a you know, big, big part of my life. In fact, we're doing a, a backpack brigade here uh, in, uh, in August. Uh, we, uh, we've, I've given away tens of thousands of backpacks to Sarasota Manatee. Well, you make sure you let me know so I can bring a couple of backpacks down. Uh, abso absolutely, absolutely well, first. buddy. Yeah, absolutely well. And we've, we've done thousands of them, and it's, it's really cool. And, and we do thousands of teddy bears to the local police departments. And, and it was really cool recently because uh, uh, I, I, uh, I was watching the news and, and you know, uh, we give them to the officers to have in their cars if they encounter a child. And, and I was watching the news and there's this kid that got lost. It was a little toddler and they didn't know who his parents were. They found the parents in like two or three hours, but you know, he was holding one of our bears, which was oh, wow. you know, really validating. And, and it was cool to see that. But, awesome. but anyway, back to real estate, because that's why people are listening. So we'll, 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 we'll have this, we'll, have, we'll get to know each other because I'm going to come up and have lunch with you, brother, because I really <laughs> have enjoyed what I'm hearing here. But let's talk, why do you think, people fail in this business? Because you're an expert in acquisitions and management. Why do you think people fail in the multifamily real estate game? I think the biggest part is they fail because the expectations. Um, and again, I think the expectations of what you see, maybe flipping properties and things like that, you bring that same mentality into the multifamily industry and you get your butt kicked. This is, again, this is checkers, our chess, not checkers. So if you bring the same game, you, you bring your checkers game to a game of chess, you can play a chess master and they're going to they're gonna kick your butt. Even the average person that plays chess is going to kick your butt. So it's the mentality of the individual stepping up maybe, you know, like my partner Joe coming from wholesaling and flipping into multifamily. And he understands and has understood, understood excuse me, quickly that the mentality and, the, and, and, and you know, the work ethic's the same, but the mentality and the understanding is totally it, It's an education, right? Would you say it's, it's – it, yeah. you can't dabble. You can't, like, jump. And I say dabblers get crushed. You can't dabble in this business. No. You still learn. I mean, guys – I mean, you've, I've given away my free 200-page book for a year and a half now. If you haven't read that and you're interested in this business, shame on you because it's like a textbook for this business. Or buy yeah. Brian's book. You know, I'm sure it's awesome. And, and so um, – and, and – you, you have to take the time to learn it. You can't, you know, and, and there's a lot of guys that are cocky that have flipped houses and kicked butt in that business because it's not quite as complex. I mean, you know, you, uh, I mean, yes, you can make mistakes there as well, but I will tell you, you know, once you've done it once or twice, you've got it. I mean, and, and but I'll say, I will say this, the same thing applies to multifamily if you study it first. And, and guys, if, uh, if you haven't heard, I've got my, got my, you know, uh, three day boot camp coming up in Chicago in August, uh, and tickets are ridiculously reasonable. So, you know, just go to multifamilybootcamp.com and check it out. It's it's kind of a no brainer. It's just me teaching yeah. you for three days, uh, and you know, no outside speakers trying to sell you stuff. It's kind of a no brainer. But uh, the education is critical. Wouldn't you agree, Brian? You just uh, yes, that, and that's yeah. that's what we're saying here. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me ask you this. Um, what would you say are some specific roadblocks to watch out for in this business? I mean, especially in this hot market that we're in right now. Talk about, you know, are you seeing mistakes being made right now? When people Absolutely. are paying too much? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. People are not, you have to sharpen your pencil. Right. You have the, you have the loom of interest rates. We have inflation that we're keeping an eye on right now. And uh, I believe the feds are keeping that inflation going a little bit just because of, you know, what we talked about in, in the podcast earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, 2005, 2008, I'm sorry, you know, um, that was disastrous for us. So I believe the feds are allowing a little bit more inf inflation, even though it's not hyperinflation yet. But, you know, I think that, you know, that's why they've been so strategic because there's been the whole talk of we were going to have a lot more hikes, interest rate hikes than what we had. Right. Um, I think we have four scheduled for 2019. But ultimately, in all in all, it wasn't as aggressive as everyone once, once forecast. So, yeah, we were sweating it. We were sweating it up to the time of this closing here on this last one because they kept popping up. We did we did get under five, but just barely. So uh, and, and, and 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 also keeping that in mind and being realistic, you know, because it's funny because you 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 know at two thousand five. Being under five is still historically great. Oh, stagger. I mean, I I remember when I do backflips if I got seven. Right. Exactly. So. Right. And, 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 and that's the thing. So when you're saying, what do we got to pay attention to? We got to pay attention to that. Let's, let's right. be realistic, people. You know, hey, if you're getting in under five, you're getting in under seven. 
uh, historically, you're still doing well. You just have to pencil out and make sure that these deals, these asking prices that, again, that the demographic, you're not buying houses, you're buying demographics. You're not buying build brick and mortar per se, because brick and mortar has never paid me rent. People pay rent. So I'm more focused on my prospect tenant than I am anything Do they else. have jobs? Are those jobs secure? Are the Where? industries secure? Are the industries recession? Right. All these things that you want to look at. Uh, exactly. Okay. So okay. I call it the strate- COTA, Strategic Evaluation of a Target Area. It's the study of building permit activity, average household size, income, mortgage interest rates, demographics, psychographics. So these are the things that I'm always constantly keeping my finger on. And this is, this, these are the indicators that I would tell your, your listeners. These right. Are, and it's so easy. Customers. It's all online, right? I mean, it's yeah. all there. You just have to go and look and, and you just can't be lazy. Bottom line. I mean, there's so many websites now. I mean, back when I started, you, you had to read it or you had to go visit it. And you had to you pay had to money for these reports. Right. Or you had to pay money for, for re, you know, heavy duty research. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, now it's all free online. It's kind of a no brainer. All right. So let me ask you this. What's, let's talk about leadership for a minute. What do you think is one characteristic that every leader should possess? Because you're obviously leading a team now. Talk, and, and, you've, and I'm sure you've managed teams in your asset management. I mean, you're managing the managers and all that. What do you think is a, a, a characteristic that every leader should embody? Well, it's funny you say that. I, um, I have a, 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 a good friend, our family friend that I grew up with, Ray Lewis, and um, I, I was YouTube and, you know, inspirational stuff the other day. And I came across one of his videos in the locker room and um, he was talking about leadership. And, uh, you know, people won't follow unless you suffered. People are not going to follow you unless you've actually been there. So your, your, your story that you shared with your listeners today about how you, you know, how you, you know, you were up there and then you fell, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't want to follow anyone that hasn't suffered. You know, I clearly have suffered. And so, you know, I'm not saying I'm the best leader. Um, however, I, I know I know what suffering is all about. And I, I wouldn't follow anyone to a foxhole that I know um, hasn't experienced, you know, that kind of suffering has come out on the other end. So for me, leaders have to have failed. And I think most people are thinking a leader has never failed or I'm going to follow someone that hasn't failed. I'm not going to follow someone that hasn't failed. Number one, your, your luck is about to run out. And I don't want to be a part of that, that, about that, that platoon. Or in that fox so when you're when you're when your your luck does run out. So I want to be around a MacGyver. I want to be around someone that can you know take a, a, a you know a, a paper clip you know and, and create something out of it and get themselves you know out of out of trouble because they've been there they've experienced something and they're not going to panic. And so I believe when you're putting together syndications and you're doing things of that nature, Mark Willis, one of the most successful CEOs in the real estate industry, um, Keller Williams, uh, CEO until he retired, is my partner in the project. You know, and again, I've, I've mentioned I have, you know, barely a high school diploma. You know, why would an individual like that want to partner with me? And, and, the, and, the, and the reason is, it's because of the experience. And um, I, you, you know what? You can tell them what I tell them. I've got a PhD in results. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, yeah, there you go. If we got PhDs in results, you can steal, think, you can steal that one from me. I got. I'll, yeah, exactly. So I get one from you. So uh, and I, I and, love and, it. And I agree with that. I think at the end of the day, when we're talking leadership, we we, just, we must talk about not only experience, but I want to know that failure, failure, failure. Yeah. I think leaders look at failure differently than most people. I think sure they do. They look at it as a learning experience because that's what yes. it is. Greatest teacher. It's never a failure unless you fail to grow and learn. Period. Absolutely. I mean, you basically fail your way to success. I've built, I've built and started 24 businesses. Several have been worth tens of millions of dollars. Most have been spectacular seminars, <laughs> failures, <laughs> flaming, flaming, explosive, you know, uh, seminars and failures. But but that's how you that's how you do it. And I tell the story. I met I met the billionaire owner of Spanx, uh, Sarah Blakely, a, a mastermind that I belong to, and and her dad asked her after school every day, "What have you failed at today?" Is that freak? Is that just the most awesome question? I love that question. See, I, you see, that's I, somebody that gets it. that right there tells me exactly when he's asking that question is the same question that I would ask, and I ask myself every day. But that's someone who clearly understands it versus someone who may have read something in a book or went to church on Sunday and got something, you know, which, you know, I'm all for all those reading a book on the church on Sunday. However, 
that you can always tell someone who's actually literally have, has lived it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so for me, the leadership is about understanding how to embrace, embrace failure. I love it. Love it. Great answer. Probably the best answer I've had on the show, buddy. That is a great answer. Well, listen, Brian, you've added tremendous value today, my friend. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, we had some AV starts and stops, but we got it worked out and, and, uh, and uh, really appreciate you being on the show, brother. I appreciate you having me, man. I look forward to being back and seeing you soon. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. For more resources or to connect with us further, please visit our website at rodcleaf.com. Tune in next week for our next show. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws.